Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Dunn, and I work from the OSCC Adult Day Program. And today we're going to talk about the meanings behind some of the most famous nursery rhymes. Nursery rhymes are weird, right? All that talk of tuffets and bridges falling. Most of us learn these rhymes as toddlers and have been reciting them from memory ever since, giving no thought to what we're actually saying. For an overthinker like myself, this is simply not acceptable. I decided to dig into some nursery rhyme meanings. One of the first things I learned in my research is that nursery rhymes are often many centuries old, so it's difficult to know their origins, never mind their true meanings. But I did my best, so let's get started. We're going to look at a few of the most famous nursery rhymes. Goosey goosey gander, whether shall I wander, upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber. There I met an old man who wasn't saying his prayers. Took him by the left leg and threw him down the stairs. Wow. Well, that took a dark turn. The most popular interpretation of this nursery rhyme is that it's a reference to religious persecution. Specifically, anti-Catholic sentiment in England forced Catholic families to hide their priests, the old man of the rhyme, in their houses in special rooms called priest holes. Yes, I'll give you a minute to stop snickering. We'll go on to the next one. Jack Spratt. Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean, and so between them both, you see, they licked the platter clean. I've seen mul multiple explanations for this little ditty, which originated around 1639. The most common one appears to be that it's about the shenanigans of King Charles I and his wife Henrietta Maria, who dissolved Parliament and imprisoned some of its members after they wouldn't let him introduce all the taxes he wanted. On to the next one, Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. During the 16th century, an English physician, Thomas Muffet, believed eating arachnids, spiders, could cure all sorts of sicknesses. It just so happened that Dr. Muffet had a daughter named Patience, who was also one of his patients. When she caught colds, she apparently had to cram spiders down her pie hole. Considering that, little Miss Muffet depicts a child fleeing from a spider, it seems safe to speculate that patients would have preferred toughing out the sniffles rather than eating the spiders. The notion of Miss Muffet as a girl who had eaten her fears is unsettling, but there's even a bleaker possibility. The Washington Post Post pointed out that the Mrs. Muffet might represent Mary, Queen of Scots. The spider symbolizes Presbyterian reformer John Knox, who perpetually berated Mary for being Catholic. According to Scotland history, Knox later helped condemn her as an alleged adulteress and murderess. She was ultimately executed. Well, that certainly changes this rhyme for me. How about you? Ring around the rosy. Ring around the rosies, a pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, and we all fall down. Ring around the rosy is said to refer to the Great Plague of 1665. The plague caused a high fever and a rash in the form of a ring, hence the name ring around a rosy. Putting herbs and spices in the pocket of an ailing person in an attempt to freshen up the stale air was common practice. Thus, the pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes is an American variation of the English version, which is a tissue, a tissue, or someone sneezing. Plague sufferers had a fit of sneezing before they passed away or when we all fell down. Ashes ashes could also refer to the ashes of dead because they were often cremated. One of the puzzling pieces of information 
regarding this rhyme is that its first known recognition date of existence was in the early 1880s, which was 250 years after the London plague and over 530 years after the Black Death. Such time difference doesn't mean that the story wasn't told until hundreds of years later though. It might just mean that this particular rhyme about the plagues wasn't written until long after the event, or maybe it was written much earlier, but it was not considered appropriate to say. So it may have gone dormant until 1880s when the terribleness of the plague was much forgotten and the rhyme could resurface. We will never know for sure. On to the next rhyme. Humpty Dumpty, we all grew up with this rhyme, right? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Did you know Humpty Dumpty was not a person at all, but a massive, massive siege cannon that were used by royalist forces, the king's men, during the English Civil War that raged between 1642 and 1651. During the siege of Colchester in 1648, the Royalists hauled Humpty Dumpty to the top of the church tower of St. Mary at the Walls. And for 11 weeks, Humpty sat on the wall and blasted away at the attacking parliamentarian redhead troops defending the town. Humpty's great fall came when the church tower was eventually blown up by the roundheads and he couldn't be put together again as he had fallen into and subsequently had become buried deep in the surrounding marshland. Without the mighty Humpty Dumpty to defend them, the King's men led by Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle were soon overrun by the parliamentarian soldiers of Thomas Fairfax. Makes you think, huh? Baba Black Sheep. Baba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One for my master and one for the dame and one for the little boy who lives down the lane. Not surprising, this rhyme is all about sheep and the importance of sheep to the England, English economy. Till the late 16th century, the final lines of the rhyme read, and none for the little boy who cries down the lane. It was changed to the current version in order to cheer it up and make it into a song more suitable for children. In medieval England, the wool trade was big business. There was enormous demand for it, mainly to produce cloth, cloth and everyone who had land, from peasants to major landowners raised sheep. The great English landowners, including lords, abbots and bishops began to count their wealth in terms of sheep with some flocks totaling over 8,000 animals, all tended by dozens of full-time shepherds. After returning from the Crusades in 1272, Edward I imposed new taxes on the wool trade in order to pay for his military ventures. It is believed that this wool tax forms a background to the rhyme. One third of the price of each bag or sack sold was for the king, which was the master, one third to the monasteries or church, which they called the dame, and none to the poor, she poor shepherd boy, the little boy who cries down the lane, who had tirelessly tended and protected the flock. Georgie Porgy, how many of you remember this song, this little uh, rhyme? Georgie Porgy pudding and pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. It is thought that Georgie Porgy in question was actually Prince Regent, later George VII, a tad on the tubby side. George weighed in about George weighed in at more than 17 and a half stones with a waist of 50 inches. Georgie Porgy put in pie. And as such, he became a constant source of ridicule in the popular press of that time. Despite his large size, George had also established for himself a rather poor reputation for his lusty romps with the fairer sex that involved several mistresses, leaving a string of illegitimate children. 
When he was 23, he fell in love with the beautiful Marianne Fitz, Fitzgerald. He was so bestowed with her that he persuaded her to go through a secret marriage. The marriage would never have been allowed as Maria was both a commoner, but much, much worse. She was a Roman Catholic. George later went on to marry Catherine of Brunswick, whom he despised so much that he even had her banned from his coronation. And so George had made both the women in his life miserable, kissed the girls and made them cry. George was also known for his foolish behavior and had apparently been at the rear of the class when badges for courage and bravery were handed out. That said, he did enjoy watching other people display their attributes. George was a great fan of bare knuckle boxing. During one of the illegal prize fights that George attended, a boxer was knocked to the floor and subsequently died of his injuries. Frightened of being implicated, the prince made a very quick exit from the scene. Therefore, the, the rhyme, when the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. The next one, Jack and Jill. Poor little pair. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. The small village of Kilmerston in North Somerset claims to be the home of, Jack and, of the Jack and Jill rhyme. Local legend recalls how the late 15th century, a young unmarried couple regularly climbed a nearby hill in order to conduct their li liaisons in private, away from the prying eyes of the village. Obviously a very close liaison, Jill fell pregnant, but just before the baby was born, Jack was killed by a rock that had fallen from their special hill. A few days later, Jill died while giving birth to their love child. Poor couple, my goodness. Their tragic tale unfolds today on a series of inscribed stones that leads along a path to that special hill. Old Mother Hubbard. Hmm. Old Mother Hubbard went to her cupboard to get her poor dog a bone, but when she got there, the cupboard was bare and so the poor dog had none. The Old Mother Hubbard rhyme allegedly refers to Cardinal Thomas Wolsey and his unsuccessful attempt to get an annulment from King Henry. Old Mother Hubbard represents Cardinal Wolsey. The cupboard represents the Catholic Church. The doggy represents Henry. The bone represents the annulment Henry wanted in order to end his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. A little bit confusing. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Wasn't this a cute little rhyme? Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. But when you look into the true meaning, not so cute. Mary is referring to Mary the first, daughter of Henry. The Catholic queen received quite a bad reputation during her short reign for executing Protestant loyalists. The garden in the rhyme is returning, referring to the growth of a graveyard. Silver bells and cockle shells are believed to be euphemisms for instruments of torture. The maids is slang for be a beheading instrument called the maiden that came into common use before the guillotine. Wow. Three blind mice. I always thought this was a tad more, but even when I used to say it to my kids. Three blind mice, three blind mice. See how they run? See how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a sight in your life as three blind mice? The first written variation of three blind mice dates from 1609. The three blind mice were the three Protestant loyalists who were accused of plotting against Queen Mary I. The poem we just recently read, the farmer's wife refers to the queen who with her husband, King Philip of Spain owned large estates. The three men were buried, burned at the stake. Wow, well, wow, well, wow. Well. What about little Jack Horner? Poor little guy. 
Little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, oh, what a good boy am I. The story behind this rhyme is that Jack is Thomas Horner, a steward to the Abbot of Glastonbury. The Abbot sent Horner to London with Christmas pie for King Henry. The deeds to 12 manor houses were hidden in the pie. The abbot did this in attempt to ingratiate himself with the king during the dissolution of the monasteries. On his trip to London, Horner put his finger in the pie and pulled out the deed to Mel's Manor. Shortly thereafter, Horner moved into the manor. His descendants have lived in the manor house for generations. Horner's descendants dispute this story and claim that the Horner fairly purchased the property from the king. You guys will have to decide for yourself. The Muffin Man. We used to sing this little ditty. Did you know the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man? Do you know the Muffin Man who lives on Drury Lane? The story of the Muffin Man is one of the most terrible in human history. And there are various versions of this story. The Muffin Man was also called the Drury Lane Dicer, and his original name was Frederick Thomas Linwood. It is believed that he was a man who introduced the concept of serial killing in England. He was born in 1563 and passed away in 1612. It is, Fred, it is said Frederick would tie a muffin to a string, and as a child tried to get it, he pulled the string, eventually luring the child to his house and giving him ample time to knock the child out with a wooden spoon and turn them into baked items to be sold at his bakery. It is alleged he killed 15 children and seven rival pastry chefs. Whoa, pretty morbid. Mary had a little lamb. We all know how that goes. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. The imagery and names used in this poem point to it, its having been constructed as a Christian homily for children. Such rhymes were extremely popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. Mary, of course, is the name of Christ's mother and on the most commonly used images for Christ is that of the Lamb of God. The fleece is white as snow, a symbol of his good, goodness and purity. The poem can be read as a parable of Christ's enduring love for mankind. Another theory I found was, to see how the poem came about, we need to go back to the early 19th century. It was reported in 1902 edition of the New York Times book review, Dr. Lyle Mason introduced singing into Boston schools in 1827. He asked noted writers to contribute songs and rhymes. And one of the contributors was Sarah Joseph Hale, who supplied Mary Had a Little Lamb. In 1913, the New York Times ran an interview with Richard K. Powers of Lancaster. He stated that Mary was his cousin. Her full name was Mary Elizabeth Sawyer. Mary had written a complete account at the age of 88. Personally, I have a few doubts. In the first place, if the lamb was so special to Mary, why didn't it have a name? And if it did have a name, why didn't she use it? Or how had she forgotten it and yet remembered so many other small details so many years afterwards? That's just a few questions that go through my mind. Also, the rhyme was not published until 1830, 14 years later. Would you still remember something a passing nine-year-old had written about your pet all those years ago? Well, there may be some dispute about whether Rulston wrote any part of the poem or whether Sarah Hale composed the whole thing. Massachusetts has nonetheless claimed the rhyme and the consequent increase in their tourist industry and both Mary Sawyer's house in Sterling until it burned down in 2007 and the small Redstone School. They have been preserved as a memorial. Today in Sterling Town Center, there stands a statue of a lamb in tribute to John Rolston and displaying the first verse of the poem. Incidentally, Mary Sawyer's Little Lamb and You 
apparently lived to be four years old and had three of her own baby lambs. For my last nursery rhyme, I chose Rockabye Baby. I chose this one for the last because I could not find a definitive meaning in the history books for this rhyme. I found a total of four theories for this rhyme. You choose which one sounds the most believable to you. Rock a bay baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come baby, cradle and all. Another rather morbid kind of verse to sing to your children. The first theory is, the Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhymes in 1951 identifies a rhyme as the first English poem written on American soil, suggesting it dates from the 17th century and that it may have been written by an English colonist who observed the way Native American women rocked their babies in birch bark cradles, which were suspended from the branches of trees, allowing the wind to rock the baby to sleep. The second theory is that the lyrics refer to events immediately preceding the glorious revolution. The baby is supposed to be the son of James, and was widely believed to be someone else's child smuggled into the birthing room in order to provide a Roman Catholic heir for James. The wind, maybe that Protestant wind or force blowing or coming from the Netherlands bringing James nephew and son-in-law William of Orange, who would eventually depose King James in the revolution. The same Protestant wind that had saved England from the Spanish Armada a century earlier. The cradle is a royal house of Stuart. The earliest recorded version of the words in print appeared with a footnote. This may serve as a warning to the proud and ambitious who climb so high that they generally fall at last, which may be read as supporting a such satirical meaning. So there's two so far very different theories. The third theory, the song is based around a 17th century ritual that took place after a newborn baby had died. The mother would hang the child from a basket on a branch in a tree and wait to see if it would come back to life. The line, when the bow breaks, the baby will fall, would suggest that the baby was dead weight, so heavy enough to break the branch. Hmm. The fourth theory is that the song is based around a 17th century British Navy to describe the treetop or cradle, now commonly referred to as the crow's nest. The powder boys or cabin boys had to climb to keep a lookout. If you keep in mind, this was the highest point in the ship and read the lyrics with this thought, the nursery rhyme makes perfect sense. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. The highest point in the ship will rock the most. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. The bow is the front of the ship and the Bow breaking describes the front of the ship breaking over a, vo a wave. And down will come baby, cradle and all. It's almost commonplace that the cradle would break during a storm. Now that you heard all four theories, which one sounds the most believable? I'm leaning on the side of the ship myself. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation on the hidden meaning behind the nursery rhymes. I personally will not look at these cute little ditties in the same way again. 